phone here with ModSnap Radio, and we're here with Claude of Anything Box, and they're playing live tonight <laughs> over at the Amp Room with T for Two. Claude, thank you so much for spending some time with us here. Thank to you talk. for having me. Yeah, this is fantastic. This is actually a dream come true for me. Uh, I've been listening to you since my high school days, and you were pretty much in high school when, when you were playing this music. Uh, there they are. Only one. I just, uh, I want to... We wanted to talk to you a little bit about how did the band get started, first of all? In my head. Okay. <laughs> it all started here. No, um, it actually started with a name, okay. right? Uh, it's one of those weird things that happens. I was in, in a library, I was reading a book, and I really liked it. And it was one of those things where I felt a kinship with the story and what it was saying and I felt that it translated really well into what I wanted to do musically so the Anything Box book became the name and then it was just like how do I make this work and it took a lot of different iterations um, before I finally got it down to you know the early stages, which you know, Mike's sitting right over, standing right over there. He was in the band. He was one of the first band members I had. Uh, steady one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, from there, um, that's where it started. So it's not like a, a rags to riches story or anything crazy like that. But what I can say that is not often talked about is that. I viewed it as an obsession. Okay. Um, it's not something I did for fun. It isn't something that I started because I just wanted to do music or meet girls or anything. Like, like none of that stuff fits the criteria. I was really serious about it, and I really loved music. It was it was that desire to like stuff's coming out, and I don't know what to do with it. And it has to go somewhere. So it was a creative outlet for you, yeah. a work of, uh, it was passion for you, a work of passion? Yeah, and it was out, actually, it, it's something that's echoing back to me now, which is another thing he knows a lot about. <laughs> I'm referring to the guy that can't be seen again. Um, I used to have a room that I used to call the music room, mm -hmm. and this room was gigantic. And I was very lucky to have it. And on one side of the room were two 18-inch Sherwin Vegas. And on the other side of the room were all the machines and the sequencers. So when I would play stuff, it would be very, very loud. So it was as though we were at a, at a club, as though we were actually dancing to it. So I was able to explore those things at the right levels, so at the were, levels at that, that everything was happening. You were creating that club experience, and, and was this at your house? It was at my house, so I was able to like create this atmosphere for myself where I was like, this is gonna work, and I would just literally, we would literally take the stuff that we would record and then just like, on that weekend, give it to someone and they'd play it and sound just like it did in that giant room. So for us, that was the big, the big deal, you know? to be able to take something that you make and make it tangible, you know, make it real, so. No, is this all before Peace came out, or is this Peace? Yeah, oh, Living in Oblivion was, was written in that room, Kiss of Love was written in that room, um, When We Lie, all that stuff, basically, with the exception of maybe three songs were not were that were not written there, were basically all written in what we used to call the music room, this gigantic, room where I had painted the floors, I had paintings on the walls, I would do murals on one day and then blast the system with, you know, 808 kick drums for the rest of the week. Wow. So that was where everything really started. And, and that was like, that's what was cool. Is like, we didn't have to go to rehearsal hall, we didn't have to have any of that stuff. We had our, all our own gear early on to record stuff, uh, which was a miracle that we had some stuff. Because we were all shit poor at the time, but we were lucky that we, you know, we had access to stuff. So, yeah, that's that's where it began. You know, those weird, secluded corners. You know, 
Now, you had an album that was partially lost and then restored. Mm -hmm. So, how did that happen and how did you restore that album? Recovered. Recovered. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a, an album that I was working on. It was going to be called Exhibition. That was going to be its name. And I had recorded all the demos. So basically all the 14 songs or whatever it was, it was there's like six or seven that are lost forever, um, sounds and all. And we had an accident where the, that machine just basically ate all the masters. And that's a digital audio yeah, tape. Yeah, digital audio tape. And as you know, digital audio tape has time codes, so you, I didn't know this. You can't just slice it and put it back together. That doesn't work. But what I did discover years later was, and I don't know why I saved the thing, but I did. You could start from where you left off and that be zero. For some reason, the machine will pick it up at zero. Mm -hmm. And from then on, the clock will read and you can actually listen to what's on there. So I was able to grab what was left of the two ends of, of, of this DAT. <laughs> One, I had to thread backwards, which was really bizarre on a thing that's about Yay big. <laughs> if you remember that. Um, half the size of a cassette, guys. So, remember cassettes? Actually, they do, because those have made a comeback. I know. I know. I have a few. <laughs> I recently found a few of those. Um, but yeah, so I was able to restore it that way. And then that came out as recovered and, and not exhibition, because obviously half the stuff. But what was really weird was that not only did the audio get lost, but the sequences that were on the main sequencer, which was an MPC at the time, also for whatever reason, it's quarter inch floppy drive. Remember those? <laughs> it also died. So there was no way to go back and redo the sequences. So half the songs were like in my head and I couldn't remember like all the, the different parts. And it was like, I hate this album, so I just threw it away. And then years later, of course. You wouldn't revisit yeah. it. And that's now one of my favorite ones, which is really fun. That's the only one I can listen to on my own. It's just a fan. And also, uh, I, 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 like many fans, was able to get the reissue of Hope on vinyl. You guys did that a couple of years ago. You did a beautiful starburst. It's like black and blue. The Russian collusion. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful reissue. What made you decide to reissue that album on vinyl? The Russians. Oh, was it, it wasn't. They're, they're crazy, man. <laughs> so, so that was not. That wasn't. It you. wasn't. It wasn't my idea to do it on vinyl. It was that their approach was so passionate. Uh, they're like, we're gonna do it like this. You can do the artwork a little different. We can do something different. And I'm like, can I just send you odd photos and things, and you'll put it in there? And he's like, yeah. So it was a deal that I made with them. Again, collusion. I like using that word in this video. Um, so it was one of those things where it's, it's something that I've learned recently that I realized that I do. I can tell within five minutes whether I'm going to do a deal or not. And if it feels good, I'm just going to do it. If it turns out to be a bad decision, oh well. But if, it, if the gut says do it, you do it. And at that time, I really felt that it was a good thing to do because they, they were really into it. And I, I did what I could to help them. Uh, make it the way it is and they did a really great job it was beautiful it really so. was and can we talk a little bit about distances sure so this album came out it was a, a, a double CD and and I was it's fantastic it's, it feels like two complete albums so how, how long did it take you to put this album together can you talk a little bit about the creative process that record I still call them records. Um, was a very trying experience because it was something that I did through crowdfunding, which I'd never done before. And as as it started, there was only about fourteen songs, so it was going to be just one album. And I thought of it as, oh, it's going to be about nine songs, ten songs, and it's going to be you know, short, sweet. And note, note and advice to all people who want to do um, crowdfunded albums. Make sure that you recorded half the album 
before you actually do the campaign so that you don't get caught into this creative trap I'm about to talk about. That was free advice there. Um, what happened was that as I started recording the record, as it was being crowdfunded, for real, the way that, that normally it's not done that way, I found out later, um, I started to have like creative urges, you know, like, oh my god, I have two, two more songs in my head. Oh my god, I just wrote a song today. You know, what do you do? And you just keep going, and you're like, and the next thing you know, I had 26 or 27 songs to choose from. And I was like, what am I going to do? And then the dumbest idea on earth came to me, which was to make it a two CD album. <laughs> Never do that, guys. Um, so you're right, it's two distinctly different things. There's the, the, the closer side and the farther side. <laughs> um, but I enjoyed that process a lot. I thought that this was the way I'd probably work forever but just not, not make things that long anymore. Just, I liked the process, which was, I went back to basics, I made a bunch of rules, and I basis, basically stuck to those rules. No more than 12 tracks uh, on, on each song. No more than um, two or three synths that I'm working with that I'm gonna take sounds from. In other words, you're not gonna have an endless supply of you know plugins or whatever to choose from you're going to choose five or six of them and those are going to be the five or six that are throughout the whole record no matter what um sampling uh comes back <laughs> um go digital all the way no analog that's the other weird thing on that record no analog on it um everything on it is digital um so you're not using like toy pianos or or anything like that? Samples. They are yes. Yeah. Organic things are allowed. But if it was an analog synth, I wasn't going to create a bass sound on it when I could do it on the computer because it was just easier. So that's that's a, a done deal. Okay. But there were a lot of organic things. Um, and that I never really talked about before. But I guess I'll get into it now because that's where it's kind of where it took me, right? With it, I started to do odd things like circuit bend. Uh, instruments, phones, whatever makes a sound, I probably opened it up and put two wires together to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. And mostly it meant buying a new phone, but... <laughs> but, um, I say that because a friend of mine actually lent me a keyboard to circuit bend, and the first bend destroyed it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, it's okay, man, it's alright, I still owe him one. But, yeah, so basically circuit bending, um, uh, taking real world, uh, a little toy piano that we have at home that I actually used. I think you posted a photo of it, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. on your Facebook page. Absolutely. The funny thing about that is you can't even recognize it because it got destroyed yeah. sonically. Like, you can't even tell. It might be a bass sound on a song, and you won't even know it if it's, if it's a toy piano. So I've always been into uh, manipulation of things mm -hmm. to take them away from what they are. So I did that by recording just organic sounds. And I found that I really liked it. Uh, there's a sound that, that is actually goes throughout the record in various places. That's actually the sound of my phone. You know when you take a phone and you, and you get a phone call or something and the speaker picks up the little... Sure. What I did was I literally recorded that for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I took that and out of that, I made loops and samples. Oh, so I have a whole little library of just phone sounds, what I call phone sounds. So that kind of stuff um, was the stuff I really wanted to do with it, with that record. And, I, and at the same time, be able to time travel back to the early days and, and, and make it very simplistic. No guitars. <laughs> and if there are any sounds that sound like one there, it's not a real one. It's something, you know, not that I have anything against guitars, but, you know, I did a blues album, but, but um, it's just for anything box, I decided once and for all, I, I figured it out, what, I, what it is that anything box is, and, I, and, I, and that took a long time, so, and for me, it's electronic, 
to be electronic, to really push that envelope. And you, but you released it as Claude. That was the dumbest mistake I ever made. Um, another advice to bands. If you're the guy, release it as the band. <laughs> we had a voting process, and we were three at the time, and it was two to one to call it Anything Box, an Anything Box album. And I think we fought about this for like months. And then in the end, to keep the peace, it was like, you know what? The three of us are gonna stay together forever, so yeah. I'll do it as Claude, anything box continues and we're good. And then like two months later, I'm by myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bad mistake, right? Uh, now I have an album that, I, that doesn't have my, my real band name on it. Um, but um, that's okay. I learned, I learned a valuable lesson. I think that's when I really learned like, oh my God, all of it is anything box. I've just been... Well, you've done that before. I've done the amount, yeah. But with, the, with the diary, right? Yeah, but the, but the diary, I mean, look, when I recorded, um, I'm going to talk about an album you guys probably never heard of, but I recorded an album called Seven Sleepless Nights, right? Which I recorded in a week and a half with a stereo recorder, just like the one you had earlier, and a guitar and a voice, straight to tape, and then do the manipulations after the whole recording is done. So I could only manipulate the master, right? Yeah. And obviously, that does not sound like an Anything Box album. It sounds like a guy doing blues. So that I wouldn't call an Anything Box album. But the, the Claude Distances definitely sounds like an yeah, Anything like an Box album. It, it is an Anything Box album. And everybody's, you know, like I, I get this problem all the time with radio stations, especially. They're like, we just played Anything Box, fast forward. And I'm like, um, technically it's not. But I, I like that you said that, and then they're like, well, it is, mate, it is. It was a guy from England, he just said, it, it's an anything box album. Like, what am I supposed to call it? Like, I guess you're right. I'm kind of glad that you can barely see my name on the cover. <laughs> so, yeah, it's technically an anything box album. So what's going on with you now? What, what are, I know that you're out here performing, you're, you're, you're here today, uh, you're in Houston tomorrow. Uh, creatively speaking, what's going on with you? Well... I'm working towards that big space again because I want to make things big again in a weird way. Like, I've been painting a lot, I've been doing a lot of art. Um, so, when I'm not touring, which I've been doing quite a bit of it, when I'm not touring, I've been painting more than anything. But, as uh, I told you, how I do rules, right? Yes. So one of the things I'm building, which I posted recently, is um, I'm deciding to build a mechanical instrument. Oh, that's... So I'm actually building a mechanical instrument that has things that spin and do things inside, mm -hmm. and a circuit bent because of the way that it's wired. And I'm working on that, and from there, I think all the samples and things that I need for whatever the next thing is, is coming. So I am working on it. I think there's some songs in there now already. Every, basically, every time I sit down to play, I, I'm, I'm singing stuff, so I know that there's songs in there. So it's just eking out time right now to set them down. So I'm definitely... It's not stopping. But we're, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, it's weird, man. Like I, feel like, I feel like I'm more... Remember how I said I, I felt like back in 1980 I was obsessed? I am more obsessed now. I think I feel more of an obsession to create new things. And I think there's a lot of unexplored areas that when I wasn't on my own, I wasn't able to do it. And it's not because it has anything to do with my bandmates. Let me take that out of the picture. I love my bandmates. It's not that. It's just that when you have two or three people, you're always thinking of those logistics. You know, a show, for example. Hey, we got a show in Japan. I can't go. Oh, you know, there's, there's, there's something, right? Well, they have babies. Or yeah, they have babies. There's all kinds of stuff that, that gets in the way. And I'm, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. It's just that is the way it is. And the art is the same thing. Because there have been times where they're like, 
you're in this mode, like you haven't wanted to rehearse in months, what's going on? I'm painting. And then I'll sh if I show them something and they're like, oh God, this is really weird. This is really out there. It's hard to, it's hard to get all three minds to gel perfectly. And that's, that's true of any man. Sure. You ordered that, what yeah. goes through that, you know, yeah. the pressure would go through that. Everybody, all the, all everybody, the everybody has gone through it. But in my case, though, it's a little weirder because I've always been the guy behind the closed doors by myself doing everything and then everybody gets to see it. So mm -hmm. it feels more natural to me now. It, it's like now it's like, hey, I recorded this this morning and if I want, I, everybody could hear it by the end of the day and I don't need to vote on it. I don't need to... For good or bad, I don't need to have a committee on it. So some of that has gotten easier. So in, 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 as a result, more stuff's coming. And that's one of the things that I really like like about you as a person is that you make things available for the fans. Uh, you know, you make your demos available. That's been very cool. There's a lot more of those coming too. Oh, that's great <laughs> because I do play those in, on my show as well. It's like, oh, listen to this old this uh, this version that he he, he uh, put out for the fans. Uh, it's, it's that's that's cool because you get to hear where things started versus where they ended up. And, and sometimes it's... where they started is where they end up. Yes. Because that's the other side of it. Okay, so now I'm going to go on a rant. <laughs> Recording. Recording 101. I love modern things. So I'm a, I'm a computer nerd. I love software. I love digital manipulation. I love all that stuff apps, whatever it is you want to throw at me, I love it. Mm -hmm. However, one thing that I feel that the computer did wrong is that everyone adheres to this must have 150 tracks in a song, everything must be perfect, everything must be aligned, and that I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. So I, the way I look at it is the computer is the greatest recording instrument we've ever had. So why can't it just record reality? If you sat in a room and you played this little piano and that's where the sample came from and all you want to do is add that drum machine and you just want to sing over it and that is the song? That is the song. So the word demo is an odd word for me. Because I come from the old school. Like if you look at like early Beatles recordings, you could call them demos. They basically got in the middle of a room, someone went one, two, three, four, they went for it, and whatever was done, it's done. There was no going back to fix that guitar, and there was like, oh, you cracked on that vocal, you know, like, there was none of that. So what you have is a slice of a real thing, like, like a photo that you took that you didn't put a filter on or, you know, manipulate in any way. Whatever it is, it is that little slice of time. And I think that that that's kind of missing, especially in electronic music, because it's too easy to fix things. So I purposely will do things that I know certain engineers would cringe at. Like if I if I record a part and I really like it, I think like this is how I like it, I render it. I can't go back. And I'll literally throw away that preset so I can't go back to edit it. It is what it is now, so I'm forced. I'm like, whatever this is gonna turn into, I have to work around it now. And I think that that makes for real interesting music, not just, oh, you know, I just bought, you know, the latest blah, 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 and I'm going to use it on my record, and the latest blah, 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 and I'm going to use it on It's like, buy things, sure. Yeah, you're talking about sterility almost in, in, in a way that you can you can whittle things down and, and, and always go back and, and, and you can... You can almost tear it and re-tear it and re-tear it. Until there's it, nothing left. Yeah. And recently, I think I've loved getting my hands dirty, where I'm like, you know, I'll never get this sound again, so whatever it is I'm going to do with it, I better record it. I better record something, a riff, something, because whatever this is, it's never going to happen again. And that got me interested in, in of course, mathematics and, and weird... Uh, algorithmic types of music where you actually set up parameters and you say, okay, for these eight bars, computer, you're going to do this, and I'm not going to have any control over what you do, but I'm going to record the end result, and whatever's left, from there I'll take my my riffs, and from there I think I'm, I'm going to figure out something for a song. Mm -hmm. 
And those are cool things because they don't repeat. So those are those kinds of weird experiments that towards the end of distances, I was already trying. So that the experiment, the uh, instrumentals are an example of me messing around in real time, right? So I thought, I'm gonna do a lot more of that. Set up parameters for the digital gear to do, and then send it all to filters, and then just record the results and see what happens. And then, you know, maybe nothing happens, but at least it's real. Like, you, you didn't whittle it down to just like, oh, it's a sterile piece now, because everything is so neat, mm -hmm. you know? Well, even New Order, when they talked about uh, breaking down some of their songs, and they said, well, you see how this is out of sequence. They technically we should have corrected it, but when you put all the layers on top, it's perfect. You know, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. There is a beauty in the inaccuracies. Absolutely. So that's kind of like my mode right now. That's so awesome. <laughs> so awesome. Hence, you build mechanical instruments that don't, that can't sync to a clock, mm -hmm. and then you're like, how am I going to make a song out of this? Well, so long as it loops back, you can do something. So we'll see what happens. You know? Well, Claude, thank you so much for your time. It's been a fantastic conversation. <laughs> thank you. You've been uh, listening and watching Mod Snap Radio on our interview with Claude of, any, of Anything Box. Claude, Anything Box, Claude. <laughs> uh, he, he is performing tonight uh, at uh, the Amp Room, and will be performing tomorrow night at Numbers in Houston. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I know.